Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're listening on and leave me a rating and review. This is really helpful and allows me to keep producing good content for free by drawing on more top names in the industry for the show. This week's podcast is all about soil testing. In this episode, we dive into the importance of soil testing, some of the different types of soil tests, and how to understand and interpret the results. Our guest this week is Chris Borgman. Chris earned a Bachelor's of Science in Crop and Soil Science from Washington State University and has over 19 years of experience in agronomy, field management, sustainable programs surrounding agricultural turf and natural environments. He is currently the president of agronomy for Unibest International, who are the makers of the Soil Savvy Test Kits. The ion exchange technology in these kits has been utilized by large agribusiness companies like Wilbur Alice, McGregor, Crop Production Services, Simplot, and much more. Chris also manages a large family drylands and irrigated wheat farming operation in eastern Washington. Welcome to the show, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Tad. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, so today we're talking all about soil testing. And I want to start off with a little bit of your background, not going too deeply, but just a, a really brief idea of where, how you got into this realm and, and what your background is with soil testing. Yeah, yeah, really my background started out, uh, I uh, acquired or earned my uh, Bachelor's of Science degree in Crop and Soil Science from Washington State University. Uh, that degree had a turf grass emphasis, and so I really focused on turf grass systems From there, I graduated and became a a golf course superintendent and worked at a couple golf courses, uh, built two golf courses and grew them in. Uh, The last golf course I was at, uh, we built and grew it in and I was there for about three years. And in that time, I, I met the owner of Unibest International who uh, has the soil savvy product that we'll be talking about today. Uh, He was curious if uh, I was interested in the technology that he had and if it was applicable to turf grass. And I was really blown away by this technology that he had and the accuracy of this technology and and soil sampling. Uh, He mentioned that he was looking for an agronomist and uh, I actually made a, a career change to come work for Unibest to develop the soil savvy product and I've been here for seven years almost eight years now Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why someone would want to soil test. What's what sort of actionable information does it give you with soil testing? Yeah, so soil testing is really going to give you uh, you know the best opportunity or ability to manage the the system that uh, that you're looking to uh, manage this can be you know, large scale agricultural systems or, you know, small scale plot size um, gardens at home, potting plants, I mean, you name it. But really, we want a soil test to give ourselves the, the highest probability of achieving high quality or, or yield. And so soil testing is a very critical component of um, achieving uh, both quality and yield in these systems that, uh, that we're managing. You know, I like to look at it as a way of helping avoid making mistakes. So soil testing will tell us uh, essentially what sort of excesses and deficiencies we have or things that might be building up over time if we're reusing the soil. Uh, I, I think it's, personally, I think soil testing is really important. So if, if we could talk a little bit more about the different types of soil tests, can you talk a little bit about, you know, I know there's a bunch out there. Can you just touch briefly on uh, the, the major ones that people may be familiar with? Yeah, sure. So uh, the major soil tests that are that are currently offered to to most of us uh, are often through extension agencies, but uh, you might have direct access to soil testing labs. Uh, these labs are going to offer chemical extraction type soil tests and maybe uh, paste extractions. Um, our our chemical extraction soil tests are our most common, especially in commercial agriculture. This is where they use different types of weak or strong acids to essentially 
Um, they apply these acids to your soil and extract off the nutrients that are in your soil that may be available to a crop that is growing. Um, there's also uh, paste extractions. Um, these and simple would take your soil, make it into a slurry, and the paste extractions really look at the, the solution or soluble forms of nutrients within, within your soil type. Uh, those are really the two main, uh, the chemical extraction and the paste extraction are the two main soil tests that are most familiar to, to most growers or agronomists. So I'm most familiar with the Malik 3 test. That's the one that we typically use. And as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, what we're getting when we use that Malik test is we're getting an, an idea of everything that's in that soil, but not necessarily what's currently available to the plant. Whereas with that uh, saturated paste test, that's telling us a little bit more about what is currently soluble and plants, uh, you know, more plants available. Is that is that an accurate way of describing the two? Yeah. So the the malic um, extraction is going to be, you know, an acid type extraction, and it's really dependent on the soil type that that you have and what extraction is going to give you the the best. Uh, idea of nutrient availability in your soil. So there's a lot of different types of Malik, the Bray, the Olsen. There's a lot of different types of extractions and the accuracy of those extractions really depend on the soil type that you have. And often labs use certain extractions for areas where most of their soil samples come from. And then the paste extraction obviously is going to give you a better look at the soluble forms of that total amount of nutrient, what's actually soluble and in the solution phase that would be available to your plants. Yeah, and I think it's important for growers to know what type of test that lab is using that they go with so that they know if they're getting a Bray, uh, a Bray extraction or a Malik 3 extraction uh, so that they can base uh, have some sort of basis for those results. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to know that and um, you know once you've once you've gotten results from a lab it's it's best to really stick to that lab and look at those results compared to the responses in your crops and start to really you know mesh those those tests with your crop responses and kind of stick with that lab that um, that you're using it's not good to change labs or send soils to different labs because it really gets confusing to um, us as growers or agronomists um, and trying to interpret these tests across labs. Um, we should be able to do that, but currently in industry, um, they recommend that you stick with one lab versus trying to send your soils you know, to all different labs and see what responses or what readings you get from multiple labs. Yeah, we've actually done that where we've sent same samples to two different labs and gotten you know, fairly similar, but different results. You know, the pH can vary by as much as 0.4 between these two. Uh, we've seen different calcium and magnesium levels. Uh, I, I totally agree with you that it is important to stay with a lab once you like a lab. Now, personally, we've been using the standard soil test at Logan Labs uh, because we work with, uh, we've worked with Steve Solomon and Erica Reinheimer, and it makes it really easy if everyone's using the same uh, lab results. So that's the one that I'm most comfortable with, but I've seen tests from all these other labs too. And they make these recommendations, but I think for listeners, it's important to realize that these recommendations are sometimes based on certain crops or crops that uh, are different than cannabis. So it's good to know, are they making a re recommendation for turf grass or for potatoes or for tomatoes? Uh, that can factor into how you interpret these results as well. Yeah, correct. So you typically when you submit a soil sample to a lab, um, if you want recommendations, they're usually going to ask you uh, what the crop is that you're growing, maybe what the previous crops were. And then usually, you know, they want they're going to ask for a yield goal that you're trying to achieve. And that really drives recommendations in commercial agriculture. Now, obviously, if we're not dealing with commercial agricultural applications, you could probably still uh, provide the crop, say tomatoes, for example, the, it's a commercial crop as well. 
um, you could provide that, but the recommendations may not be sp specific to the systems that you're trying to manage. And I think that'll lead into a little bit about the um, soil savvy um, technology that we're offering and how we can help growers with the specific systems and recommendations that they're that they're managing. So just to highlight a couple of things that you've already covered. So it's important to stay with a lab once you go with a lab, know the type of test that they're doing and realize that these, te these test results are guidelines. They're not written in stone. Uh, you're, so your actual soil may be, you know, within a certain percentage or um, close to the results that you're getting, but not necessarily exactly those numbers. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, and like I mentioned previously, you really want to, you know, look at your, you know, look at your plants, you know, if you're doing tissue testing, stay on top of that. If you're seeing consistent, you know, deficiencies in certain nutrients and, you know, maybe you're picking those up on the standard soil analysis and maybe you're not, but you want to keep comparing those those tests to one another and, you know, just your visual observations of, of your plants um, and your tissue samples in conjunction with that soil test is going to start to kind of lead you in the, the proper direction and nutrient management. If you're seeing the same deficiencies over and over again, obviously we need to, you know, maybe amend these soils with these specific nutrients. And that way, you know, we're not trying to make up with foliar applications during the, the growing time. Uh, we want to make sure that those nutrients are in the soil, they're available to the plant. Once that plant starts to grow, a lot of times plants will begin to adjust in quality and yield um, in deficient systems um, and may not display all the deficiencies, but they're going to start adjusting to it based on the deficiencies in the soil. So we always want to start with building a good soil. So as an agronomist, you're not just looking at the soil test, but you're also looking at where your last crop finished in terms of yield. You're looking at what you're visually seeing. So for example, if the if the soil test showed sufficient magnesium, but you're seeing magnesium deficiencies, that may lead you to believe that that magnesium may not be plant available or that you may still need to do applications to get those levels up or adjust the pH. So uh, you're not just looking at these soil tests, but they're another tool in your sort of your agronomist toolbox, would you say? Yeah, exactly. You want to use all the tools, you know, and we've talked about, you know, chemical extractions, paste extractions. We've talked about tissue sampling so far, and then we're going to get into uh, resin testing and what that's going to offer. We have all of these tools, and it's not saying that, you know, one's maybe better than the other. They all have their place and fit, and what we're trying to do is just bridge the gap between all of these different tools to help us manage these these systems. Great, and I think another important factor is the biological aspect of all of this. So in organic soils, we're counting on the microorganisms releasing these nutrients. So the, the soil test that we've talked about so far, all of these tests sort of give us an idea of, of all of what's in the soil, not necessarily what's available. And that's where the having good biological activity in the soil helps release these nutrients to the plant. No, the biologicals, even in uh, commercial agriculture, large-scale agriculture becoming one of the biggest um, sectors or increasing sales are in biologicals. And we're really starting to realize, even in commercial agricultural systems, that biologics play a huge role in, in soils and keeping those soils essentially alive and you know, the more micro microorganisms, the more uh, activity we have going on in those soils that are continually breaking down nutrients, holding nutrients, and it's just uh, a much better system than having, you know, more of a, a chemical fallow type system where you essentially are not promoting that biological aspect of, of those systems. Great. So let's dive in a little bit more about the soil savvy test now i grilled you guys when i first found out about your product uh, i was really excited for the potential of it and uh, i want to just kind of go through some of that conversation that we had uh, you know months ago in terms of some of the questions i had about the soil savvy test so can you tell give a little background into what what the test is and how it works Sure. Yeah. So the soil savvy test really started with in, with the foundation of what we call our ion exchange resin technology. This technology was acquired by our company out of Montana State University. And really, uh, we've spent most of our time 
in commercial agriculture, uh, building the foundation, the baselines for, for resin uh, soil testing and agriculture. But what we've done is after, after we've uh, built that foundation and got traction in agriculture, we really moved into more specialty type systems um, all the way to where we're offering what we're calling soil savvy, which is more for our independent gardeners, our, our homeowners that, that need access to a, a soil test that they can read, they can understand, they can interpret. And then it also provides them with an actionable item, a recommendation for both an organic or synthetic fertilizer to help them you know, with their with their cropping system. And so the base of uh, soil savvy, the soil savvy test kit really came out of commercial agriculture. And even uh, when we look at the turf grass applications that are available with soil savvy, um, those came from, you know, golf courses, sports turf fields, all that data that backs that up. Um, came from these applications and we've just moved that to make it available to the homeowner or the um, or the the local landscaper uh, there's a lot of applications for this uh, soil savvy product so essentially the way it works is like a an artificial or synthetic root in terms of uh, you're, you're putting the soil into a tiny container with a little gel like resin yeah, so uh, the resins themselves are in what we call a resin capsule, and as Tad mentioned, this is essentially mimicking a plant root. And the way that the, that our system works is that these ion exchange resins can only absorb nutrients from the soil if it's in a form available for plant uptake. So if you have nutrients in your soil and they're not actually in a form available for plant uptake, say they're tied up, uh, your phosphorus is tied up with your calcium or your pH is reducing the availability of your phosphorus, uh, the resins are really going to account for that. So when we talked about uh, our standard soil analysis or our chemical extractions, they're really telling us, okay, this is what's in our soil, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those nutrients are in a form available for plant uptake. So now we have the resin test that's going to tell us the actual available portion of our nutrients in our soil uh, that are going to be available to the plant. And it's almost like taking a tissue test in the soil uh, we have a lot of data that correlates what we see in the soil with the resin test back to tissue concentrations in the plant. So it's almost like taking a tissue test but in the soil. And we're also on the predictive side. We're predicting um, an excess of a nutrient or a deficiency of the nutrient in the soil prior to even planting a plant or starting a cropping system. So we have the ability to go in and amend that soil or build it to what we need based on nutrient availability of that particular soil. I'm glad you mentioned tissue testing because that's something that with cannabis is not available to, I'd say, you know, 95% of the growers out there because of the fact it is, uh, it is cannabis. So having the ability to get something that will offer you know, similar results as tissue testing in, in a form that is uh, affordable, but also uh, easy to access, I think is really a handy tool for growers. So like you mentioned, the Malik test or the Logan Labs test that we've been using is the standard soil test will tell us everything in the soil, more or less in an idea of what it is. And then the soil savvy test will tell us what's currently available out of all those nutrients into the soil. Because it really doesn't matter how much total calcium I have if not enough of it's in a form that the plant can actually uptake it. And I think that's really important. So on that note, uh, let's talk about ways you could utilize this test to actually make some good changes in your garden. So for example, for me, I love the idea that knowing if I get a bumper crop with a particular cultivar that I'm growing, I could test that soil and set that as my benchmark standard for future crops. So if my next crop isn't quite as good, I could do another test and know relatively quickly, uh, oh, my, my manganese levels have dropped off and maybe that's the difference, or my calcium levels are lower, whatever particular micro or macronutrient has changed, I can make relatively quick adjustments to that soil. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a the great way to position the the test within within those systems. You're always 
comparing back and forth, we've mentioned this, you know, many times just in this podcast, you know, that uh, we're always we're always watching the plants and we're always comparing that back to our, our analysis of our soil that we that we currently have available and making, you know, those changes, even though the analysis might not come back and tell you the exact thing you need to be doing. You know, as managers, we're continuing to compare, you know, what we're seeing and make adjustments as we go. Speaking of adjustments, the other way I thought this test would be really handy would be I could take a test, a soil savvy test, apply a particular fertilizer or nutrient, and then do another test, say, a few days later, a week later, two weeks later, at whatever point in time frame, I want to know how available that actual um, application had been to the plant. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that is, that's a great way we're doing that in agriculture as well. And really, you know, when we, we have a, a limited amount, an unlimited amount of fertility products out there on the market, biologicals, they all claim have claims, you know, that they do certain things or provide the best uh, nutrient availability. But we really don't know once we apply those nutrients to the soil or those biologicals, you know, the effects, we haven't been able to really quantify those, those effects of these applications. But with the, with the resin technology, we can, we can, we can take a test, we can look at our baseline soil before an application, then we can apply either a biological or certain nutrient package that is available to you guys that you're using, we can apply it to the soil, uh, wait a little bit of time, maybe a week or so, um, come back, soil test again, send that in and look at the, you know, the efficacy or the value of the, that nutrient that we applied. Maybe that, that nutrient in your specific soil type isn't the right one. Um, and you can make adjustments to determine, you know, which products are really the best for the soil types that you're growing uh, your plants in. And one other thing I wanted to touch on for me was what was the big difference between saturated paste tests and uh, this soil savvy test then? Because they're both essentially telling you what's soluble or, or more available to the plant. And one of the features of the soil savvy test I liked was that this artificial resin or root sits in the solution for five days. So it's giving us a little more accuracy of what's breaking down and available over that time period rather than just a snapshot of what's uh, available right when the right when the lab technician is doing that saturated paste test. Is there any other differences there uh, that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, no, uh, you know, just a high level of thinking at the, of the two different testing methods. You know, our saturated paste essentially is going to tell us, you know, what's in the solution phase. So they're adding water, they're spinning that sample, and they're taking the solution and looking at what's in that solution phase. The resin technology or the soil savvy is going to look at what nutrients are in that uh, the, in the solution phase, but it goes beyond that because once the nutrients are absorbed out of the solution phase by the um, by the resin, it then starts to exchange for available nutrients on exchange sites. So it goes beyond just that snapshot of what's in the solution phase. It's going to tell us, okay, once we've absorbed nutrients from the solution phase, what's that soil's ability to continue to provide available nutrients once we have absorbed it from the solution phase? And that's where the resins are very dynamic and seeing what the plant's actually going to see in that soil type because we absorb from the solution phase and then we go and absorb from the cation exchange sites on the, on the soils and we know what those that soil's ability is to continue to provide available nutrients. That's great. One other thing that I forgot to mention earlier that I get asked a lot are about these home soil test kits that you see at like, you know, Home Depot or your local garden center. Uh, do you have any comments on those? I know I have some thoughts, but I thought I'd let you go first. Uh, you know, I haven't spent, I know Brennan, our VP of uh, New Market Development um, here at Unibest has spent a little more time looking into those systems, but they're so general in what they provide. Even pH testing, you know, at uh, laboratories still today, is a, um, as Tad mentioned earlier, it can vary, you know, almost a half a pH unit depending on the lab and how they do pHs. And I can only think that the variability in a home test kit 
uh, for pH and other, you know, even NPK can be highly variable. And I think the level of, of you know, soil testing and management of where where we're at today, I just don't think, um, you know, that's, that's going to be enough to provide us with actionable recommendations. Yeah, you know, I found these home kits to be very inaccurate personally, and I, we won't sell them at our, at our feed, farm and feed store or garden center because I just don't think they give us good information. As, as you mentioned, these, these tests, you know, they're, um, they're doing it all right there. You're going to see a color change sometimes. So you're being asked to interpret a color and that's really challenging in a lot of ways. And you guys have a lot of expensive, you know, equipment that you're, you're using. And so for me to spend 25 to $30 on a soil test and send it into a laboratory that's going to have a technician that's trained on interpreting the results and also using much more expensive lab equipment than I can afford at my, you know, in my, in my garden uh, to interpret those results, I think is really important. So uh, moving on here, now that we've kind of covered your test and also uh, these other types of soil tests and the way they can be used, can we talk a little bit more about what someone might see on a soil test in terms of what these, you know, what these different categories or numbers are and what, what they really mean? Uh, can, we, can you talk a little bit more about what, what pH is? Yeah, so uh, on the soil test, I guess we'll kind of transition more to speaking uh, about the soil savvy test. Uh, but any test, when we talk about nutrients, a lot of times you're going to see uh, the pH or the percent hydrogen, and you're also going to see uh, parts per million values, uh, parts per million of nutrient. Uh, you may see percentages. So there's a lot of different things you're going to see on a on a soil test. I guess. First, to talk specifically to pH, uh, what we're looking at is the percent hydrogen in that in that soil, and so it's a reverse logarithm of the amount of hydrogen in the soil. So if you think about it, the more hydrogen that you have, free hydrogen in the soil or on exchange sites, that's going to decrease your pH. Um, so, and the less hydrogen you have, you you're going to have a higher pH. And pH is really you know, the first thing that we want to tackle when we look at a soil test, if your pH is, you know, either high or low, that's one of the first things that we want to adjust before we start to tackle, you know, some of the other nutrients. So uh, if we have a low pH, for example, you know, maybe we're down at 5 or 5.5 pH, you know, that's pretty low for, for most of our plants with the exception of, you know, blueberries, azaleas, rhododendrons, you know, you can uh, be at those lower pHs. They thrive at those lower pHs. But most of our most of our crops do the best, you know, between a 6 and a 7 pH. So if our pH is low, you know, we're really going to want to look at, you know, some liming applications. And lime is essentially calcium carbonate that we're adding to the soil. And that's going to help you know, kick off some of these free hydrogens, um, get rid of those hydrogens and increase our, our pH in the soil. Um, if we have a soil test that comes back with low magnesium, you know, and our pH is low, we might want to use a, a dolomitic lime and this is going to have your magnesium component in there. So if you have low low pH and low magnesium, you'll want to use a, a dolomitic lime because that'll help you increase your uh, magnesium as well as increase your pH. So uh, when you look at a soil test, that's one of the first things I look at is what is the pH of my soil? And just a, <clears throat> by just adjusting pH alone, you can also make more nutrient available that wasn't available at that lower pH. So as we increase that pH, we can increase nutrient availability. And that might solve a lot of our, our deficiency problems alone just by adjusting pH. We've talked about, I guess, low pH. Now, what do we do for high pH? Um, you know, we're going to want to use more ammonium type products, ammonium sulfate or similar products, because now we want to add these hydrogens and these acidifying components uh, back into the soil to decrease the pH. And in the same way um, as we did with the low pH, we might increase nutrient availability of certain nutrients that weren't available under the original uh, pH regime. So pH is a, a very good place to start uh, with your soil test and really get that balanced before you start to tackle uh, your macro and micronutrients. 
Yeah, and I'll I'll post the pH availability chart, which is sort of what you were kind of discussing there uh, as you were talking about pH, so people can see uh, at what levels things are available. And one thing that's interesting too is, as you mentioned, certain things are available more available at certain pHs, and some things are at lower pH are are more available that you don't actually want, like uh, aluminum, for example, or some of the heavy metals. So keeping the pH above you know, certain levels is really important as well. And this is a really complicated topic. Uh, you know, People obviously go to school for a long time for this and there's a lot of stuff we're still learning. So we're just going really basic into it, but there's a lot of, I'll, I'll put up other resources for people who wanna read more. Uh, the other aspect of pH that I just wanted to mention is I've seen some good research showing that the uh, plant can actually buffer the pH in the rhizosphere based on uh, the exudates it puts out to select for certain microorganisms. So I've heard that the pH can vary a fair bit. So that's how you can get plants that can survive in, you know, p less than optimal pH ranges in terms of the soil test, but they can still thrive. Um, have you seen any research on this yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plants uh, definitely do that. They can adjust for certain environmental conditions, I guess. One caveat to that mean um, saying they might not be thriving, they might they may just be managing, you know, to get by. So I wouldn't, you know, just think that the plants can adjust to these things because uh, everything that plants having to, you know, give out or those plant exudates, you know, those are all being created, you know, through through light, through sunlight, you know. Uh, that's all have to be transferred. Those are all processes that take energy to do that, to buffer out, you know, the offset these soil factors. So we really want to still focus on the soil, but Tad is correct that plants can adjust for um, some of these things. But, uh, you know, obviously in the cannabis industry, we have a very uh, great opportunity to really get these soils exactly where we want them, you know, uh, especially with the, the resin technology. And I really wanted to also talk about, you know, the value of the resin technology. We've talked about all these chemical extractions. We've talked about pH and how complicated all of these components are, which extraction is the best one, you know, what do I do? The great thing about the resin technology that we've developed is it's accounting for all of those things for you. It's kind of doing that work for you in a sense, you know, the pH of your soil is going to uh, tell you what nutrients are available. The resins are going to absorb those. So it takes some of that that work or that thought out of thinking, you know, which extraction is the best or what nutrients are actually available. And so I like to think of the resin as doing a lot of that work for us that we've tried to figure out in the past. Yeah, no, that's a good point. As we as we move on to some of these other topics, some of these things that I'd, I'd like to cover are not necessarily on the soil savvy test. Uh, most of them are, but I'm actually looking at a, a Malik 3 test right now on my screen too, so I just kind of want to cover both. Uh, one of the, the ones that they offer you too is your organic matter percentage. Can we talk a little bit about what that number tells us? Yeah, so our organic matter percentage is, is a is a uh, important factor in in our soils, and you know, really, it's tied to ability of soils to hold water or certain percent moisture is really um, tied to the amount of organic matter. It really controls, say, the amount of irrigation that we can apply at one time, the holding capacity of that soil. But it's also tied to um, nutrient holding capacity and uh, more uh, cation exchange sites, the the amount of organic matter as you increase, it's going to have the ability to, to hold on to more nutrient, the ability to release more nutrient. If our microbial populations are good, it's going to continually break down this organic matter and release uh, more nutrient into our soil. So, um, having organic matter in the soil is, is, is very important. Obviously, when we get into our sandier soil systems, typically they have less organic matter, they have less ability to hold water, nutrient, and those systems are a little bit tougher to manage. But the downside of too much organic matter also is that organic matter can tie up nutrient very readily and make it not available. So as you apply these nutrients that we talked about, these products, 
there's a chance that in some soils that organic matter could tie that up immediately and it may become available over time as it gets broken down by these my this microbial population these organisms it may be become available over time but if you're managing the life cycle of a plant in a very short period of time we need to be working with nutrient you know that's more available more readily available into that solution phase in that short amount of time that we're managing that we don't want to uh, try and manage nutrient that's going to be available in a year or two. We want to man manage nutrient that's at immediate availability. Yeah, and the other thing about organic matter percentage too that I found is because uh, we're dealing with a lot of people using potting soils, is that high level can uh, break down over the time. So you may have you know twenty percent less soil at the end of your crop cycle than when you started because uh, the microorganisms are breaking that material down toward you know, the humification of that soil. And so it's important to account for that if you plan on reusing your soil to realize that you're going to have a lot less soil come recycling time um, if your organic matter percentage is higher. And any of these potting soils are going to be a lot higher than, uh, say, a field or agricultural soil where we're typically trying to get organic matter percentage above 5%. Um, and if you get up into 10%, you know, you're you're rocking um, from an agricultural perspective, but from a potting soil perspective, that's very low. What, so you kind of already jumped into the next one that I want to talk about, which is uh, cation exchange capacity or total exchange capacity. Uh, you'll see it as CEC or TCEC on uh, soil tests. Can you talk a little bit about that? You kind of already touched on it, I know. Yeah, no, this is a, a very important component and one of those components that we talked about and what the resins are, are kind of telling us as far as nutrient availability. So our CEC or our cation exchange capacity uh, is, a, is a measurement of the amount of, of nutrient or exchange, uh, exchangeable sites on a, a particular soil. So these are negatively charged sites on a soil particle. And... Uh, just as kind of a scale or an idea of like high CEC soils versus low CEC soils, a, a clay type soil, uh, because of the, the type of soil, the amount of surface area on a clay is going to have the most negative um, exchange sites. And so it's going to have ability to hold on to a lot more of our, our positively charged nutrients, our calcium, our potassium, our magnesium. It's got the ability to hold on to a lot more of that at, at one time, essentially, versus our sandier soils are going to have a low cation ex exchange capacity or a low amount of, of negative exchange sites to hold nutrients. So it's very important in how we load soils with nutrient and their ability is to actually hold that that nutrient so as we mentioned in a sandier soil you know i might not be able to put as much nutrient down at one time because i don't have the exchange capacity to tie up or hold those nutrients on those exchange sites versus a high organic matter or cec soil like with clay you're going to have a lot more exchange sites to hold on to a larger amount of, of nutrient at one time. So it's a very important measure, you know, of your soil and its nutrient holding capacity. So as Tad mentioned, you know, in, in commercial agriculture, we're trying to shoot for, you know, four or five percent organic matter, you know, on, on those soil types. But in the systems that you guys are managing with potting soil, those percentages are going to be much higher. So that um, and CEC is going to allow you to load those soils much more uh, up front and have the ability to carry it out through the life cycle of the of the plant versus uh, lower CEC soils um, and lower organic uh, matter soils. So always look at um, your uh, CEC levels of your soil. One thing that is really tied to CEC too, and I, I, I think everybody should ask for uh, this test as a, as a base saturation test. And this is a very critical test because this is gonna essentially tell us the, um, uh, the balance of bases in our soil. So this is the balance of our calcium to our magnesium and to our potassium. And the availability of those nutrients is very much tied to that that base saturation. You know, typically on a good soil, when we look at a base saturation measurement, about 75% 
you know, of our of our base saturation should be calcium. So 75% of those exchange sites roughly should be uh, <clears throat> taken up or occupied by calcium. About 4 to 7% of those exchange sites should be occupied by potassium. And then the remaining exchange sites should be uh, occupied by our magnesium, which I think is usually around, you know, 12 to 15 percent or so uh, of those exchange sites. So when you guys get a test, the base saturation is very critical because uh, depending on the balance of those nutrients on that exchange site uh, is really going to determine the availability of those nutrients. If if we have uh, too much calcium and magnesium on those exchange sites, we're going to have very low uh, base saturation number for potassium, which is a very key nutrient in, in most of our plants. And so look at that base saturation number. Get familiar with those numbers if they're offered to you. Uh, we don't do that on the soil savvy test, but this is one reason why we want to use all the tools that are available. I, you know, at Univest or Soil Savvy, we're not saying to not do a standard soil analysis because uh, we've talked about the, the critical components of these tests, the base saturation, the CEC, these components that we don't offer with just the availability test at Soil Savvy. So use these tools in conjunction with one another, as we mentioned. Um, to give yourself the best opportunity to to manage these soils. Yeah, you know, I like to think of uh, CEC sort of as a giant sponge. And it's a little bit of a double-edged sword in the sense that with a soil with a low CEC, it's not going to take very much nutrients to fill that sponge, but then it's not going to hold as much nutrients either, so we're going to have to apply nutrients more frequently. Whereas uh, something with a high CEC, it's going to hold a lot more nutrients, but it's going to take a lot more to fill that sponge as well. So uh, you have to keep that in mind, too, when you're looking at your, your cation exchange capacity. So really, really high is not necessarily a lot better. It just means you have to manage that soil differently. Now, in terms of base, base saturation percentage, you know, I've read a few different books on the subject, and everyone sort of has a slightly different idea of what they call an optimal level or optimal range. I know... Um, Currently, I'm, I'm reading a book by Neil Kinsey, and he likes to have calcium around 68% and magnesium at 12%. Depending on your crop, your potassium labels, levels may vary. Uh, I like to run potassium a little bit higher with cannabis. But that percent, base saturation percentage is essentially what percentage of that sponge is what nutrient. And uh, like you mentioned, you know, high calcium can cause less magnesium or potassium availability. Um, these things all interact together and there's relationships between these different nutrients and it gets really, really complicated. Uh, and I, it still is, a lot of it is still well over my head and I'm still learning a lot myself because um, there'll be relationships between, you know, zinc and, and another another nutrient or iron or phosphorus and and there's all these levels and in, in, in relationships that um, get very complicated I guess is there anything uh, you want to talk about in that regard or uh, do I move on to the next the next thing on the soil report yeah sure I mean like like you said uh, everybody there's kind of different ranges for these nutrients and you know one of the things that Tad just mentioned is you know potassium in the cannabis system just like in you know tomatoes is is huge and a lot of ranges for potassium are often too low for uh, these crops and uh, so when we look at nutrient levels for potassium it might say that you're in the range uh, for potassium in the range for that specific lab or even our soil savvy test it might say that you're in the range but I would say that, you know, for cannabis, you're going to want to be at the high end or even above that range because we know that cannabis is a high, has a high demand for uh, potassium. And so we want to actually be at the higher end of that range. So don't let the ranges um, totally dictate, you know, where, where you're at. It might come back that you're sufficient, but you could still see deficiencies in your tissue samples that you take or just visual uh, deficiency symptoms. And that's because it's it's saying that you're in range, but maybe uh, a lot of that potassium's not available, or you just need to continue to increase the amount of potassium to displace some of that calcium magnesium because you need more potassium for that specific crop that you're managing, uh, where those levels might be fine for 
uh, another crop. We needed to manage the high demand nutrients. Um, that was kind of my second thing. After pH, we want to look at our macronutrients and see, you know, what our macronutrient levels are, you know, and that really leads into, you know, potassium, looking at our NP and K levels and, you know, where those levels are at. And if I have a, a plant that requires a high amount of a certain nutrient, we want to uh, address that nutrient. Yeah, that's a really good point that you bring up there, that these recommendations are, like you said, just they're, they're guidelines and we need to adjust them for our specific crops. Uh, and in addition, traditionally, these recommendations uh, to by, you know, by an agrologist, by a lab to a farmer would be just enough to get that crop to grow for an optimal yield. They're not trying to necessarily build the soil. So as an organic farmer, as we're trying to reuse the soil and have this high value cash crop, uh, our recommendations may, we may want to vary our guidelines based on that and, and actually put a little bit more into the soil or try and do a little bit more to build the quality of the soil for successive, you know, successive generations of crops. All right, so Chris, one of the other questions I had was that you don't see nitrogen on, like, for example, the Logan Lab standard soil test, the Malik 3 test. Uh, can you talk a little about why that might be? Yeah, I think a, a lot of times we don't get a nitrogen measurement, uh, maybe unless it's specially requested um, on a test, because a lot of times if they're doing a grower is doing like a pre-plant uh, soil sample, um, usually they're looking at nitrates only in most of these tests, and they typically may assume that um, those nitrates are going to be readily lost or leached out of the system by the time you get to growing the crop. So they might soil test, you know, two or three months before the actual crop goes in the ground. So they would assume that most any nitrates and most systems may be lost prior to the crop going in. And so a lot of times they may not offer the, the nitrate um, test uh, unless it's maybe specifically requested. One good thing about the soil savvy test is we're going to give you a measurement of nitrate in your soil, but we're also going to give you a measurement of the amount of ammonium in your soil that's going to be available to the plant. Um, typically, ammonium has been a, lo a lot tougher nutrient to analyze for uh, with the standard analysis methods, but it's very easily absorbed. Um, by our resins and our resin blends. So we're going to give you the nitrate and ammonium portions uh, of nutrient in the soil. Uh, and that's really important to kind of managing the ratios of, of those nutrients to one another. You know, uh, we don't want to be leaching or pushing uh, a lot of nitrates through our system. So we can also build up nitrogen levels with ammonium, which can be held on exchange sites. They're not near as leachable as our, as our nitrates. So we want to balance out the amount of, of nitrate to ammonium in these systems. Um, and a lot more, a lot of the organic soils tend to have more ammonium, higher ammonium levels than nitrate. So um, just look for that on the soil savvy test and see what your balance is of these nitrogen um, components um, and try and balance those out because we don't really want to, even though we're um, a lot of times indoor and in potting systems, we're not pushing nitrates through and into the environment. We could be recycling them even. Uh, we just don't want to waste them and push them through if we don't need them. So look at the balance of your nitrate to your ammonium um, in your soil savvy uh, results as well. Yeah, excess nitrates is a big problem with the cannabis industry in terms of contributing to uh, algal blooms and other problems with our with our uh, groundwater. So if we can optimize or even limit the amount of nitrogen that we're using, not only does it save us money, but it's a lot better for the environment. That kind of leads me to my next question. So if you were a cannabis grower and you were looking to utilize soil testing and were reusing your soil, say in, in the ground or in raised beds, how would you go about, uh, what would your protocol be for that sort of a thing? Yeah, you know, uh, what I would do is, you know, at the at the end of the growing time, um, I would uh, obviously put all these soils in one place, composite these soils all together really well, um, and I would pull a, a soil sample or two and look at, you know, where our nutrient levels are at, you know, even run a standard soil analysis and see where our organics at now, uh, where our base saturations are. Uh, where our available nutrient levels are. Run the run these tests, get an idea of where they're at, and then 
Um, now we're going to have a baseline of that soil after it's um, after it's been used, and now we could actually rebuild that soil by um, knowing what our target nutrient levels are. And Soil Savvy is going to give you uh, a general recommendation or guideline of how how we could do this. We could um, come back and once again introduce our biologicals and kind of rebuild. Uh, this soil after we've already grown uh, a crop in the soil. So uh, don't think about it just pre, you know, pre-plant and in season, but also after season and uh, recycling these soils. So you can give me your comments on this, but for me, I like to know uh, everything that's in the soil. So I use that, that Malik 3 test at the end of a cycle to find out all of what's still left in that soil. And then that soil savvy test could be taken at the same time as a way to see what's currently available for that plant if I were to plant right back into it. And then I could amend that soil and, and retest prior to planting. And I think what people need to keep in mind is they think of soil testing as an expense, but we're talking about a really valuable crop here where it's it could save you uh, tons of money down the road with, with such a high value crop. You can't afford to have crop loss. Uh, in in most cases with cannabis, it's just it's too much money thrown down the drain. So, spending you know 50 bucks, 100 dollars, couple hundred dollars depending on your scale on a, on these soil tests to get you that information, I think is really really important. And uh, one thing that you touched on was you know mixing all that soil together in one place. Well, a lot of our growers may be growing different cultivars in in a, in raised beds, for example, where you're not necessarily or in the ground where you're not necessarily going to be able to move that soil or re-homogenize it. Um, what do you think about taking, you know, test samples from different beds and then just using that as a general guideline for where your soil's at? Or do you think people should be sampling every bed if, if they're going to be, you know, slightly different? Where, where do you land on that topic? I mean, if you're managing each bed differently, I think you'd want to sample each bed um, alone. Um, if you're doing the same thing across multiple beds, you can go ahead and just take soil cores or portions of soil from each of those beds and then composite them together in a bucket uh, with your hand, get a good composite of that soil. And that's going to give you a good representation of all of those beds. But yeah, if you're managing the beds differently for uh, different characteristics, you're going to want to test them uh, individually. And there's some good examples on how to take a soil sample online, but a couple of points I want to hint at is that you want to go down at least six inches and it's important to use either you know I, I guess you could use your hand I always used to use, like to use a plastic uh, shovel or a, a core sampler because if you use say for example a really a rusty old hand trowel you're potentially adding a lot of iron to that soil sample so there's little things you want to think about too when you're sampling and making sure that you're getting um, an accurate mix or sample of your your given soil so that you can you can get a more accurate result yeah that's a that's a great point you know you don't want to introduce other factors into your soil test that might throw it off such as a rusty you know soil probe or shovel uh, you want to make sure that's clean because that could definitely throw off throw off your uh, your analysis um, I think it's critical, you know, for for professionals that are doing this all the time to invest in a soil probe. Um, they're not that expensive. You can find them online very easily. You know, invest in a soil probe. It's 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 a critical tool I think to have in any anybody who's managing a cropping system. And then you know, as we get into potted plants, say we're in season during the growing time and. And we want to, you know, test like midway, you know, through the season, see where our levels are. You know, you might want a smaller diameter probe that's not going to pull as big of a core, you know, out of the pots, but maybe take multiple, take a core from multiple pots, but we want a smaller diameter core when we do that. So we're not, you know, disrupting a ton of rooting mass as we pull that um, soil uh, sample out of each of the pots. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, we have a, at work, I have a core sampler and then I also have a uh, compaction tool that's like, it looks like kind of like a <laughs> super scaled down, like, I don't know, maybe a jackhammer shape that you push down in the soil and it tells you how much, you know, PSI or pressure you have as you go down so you can see how much soil compaction. There's a lot of really fun, uh, you know, little tools and, and gadgets out there that can help you in analyzing your soil better and making, you know, actionable decisions about uh, how to manage your soil fertility and manage your soil better.
And I might throw one other uh, kind of idea or concept in there to think about when you're soil sampling. We, I mean, in, with the cannabis stuff, we really like to build that soil, um, you know, prior to the plant going in and get our get our levels for most of our nutrients where they are. And then as we go into uh, planting and afterwards in season, we want to understand, say, maybe we put uh, some slow release or some coated fertilizer prills or some type of prills in in that pot. We need to understand, you know, one, if we have those prills in there when we're taking the soil sample because one of those prills can really throw off a soil sample so it could come back very skewed so the more we can build our soil up front and then if we need to test in season we don't have those big prills and stuff in that in that pot uh, we just want to avoid any of those type of things that are going to skew your data Um, and it's usually pretty obvious when you hit those type of things um you're going to get, you know, just huge numbers that are, you know, off the chart or any, any scale because one prill of anything can really throw off a a test. So, you know, be aware of your management system, where you've placed um, nutrient um, and try to avoid, you know, those large, uh, those prills if you can. But I think building the soil up front um, is really going to give, you know, the best results for most of our macronutrients. You might manage nitrogen, um, in season a little bit a little bit differently but I think building that soil up front is really key when you say prills I assume you're talking about something like Osmocote yeah that sort of a product yeah then you know uh, we're big proponents on this podcast of getting people to go organic to really build their soil and consider it their biggest resource on their farm so a lot of what you're saying just really speaks to sort of our philosophy around farming and gardening and, and cannabis cultivation in general Uh, Again, I just want to say thank you for taking the time today to chat about soil testing, and I'll be sure to put up some more information, including that that pH availability chart, some sample uh, test results, and uh, links to the soil savvy test uh, and and website information, as well as some good resources if people want to dive further down into all of this uh, soil testing and and books they can check out. So... uh, Yeah, thanks for your time, Chris. I really appreciate it and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Tad. That was Chris Borgman with Unibest International, makers of the Soil Savvy Test Kit, which we currently have available on our website for only $30 with free shipping. The kits come with a self-addressed envelope with prepaid postage, so it's super easy to take a sample and send it into the lab for results. I encourage everyone to look into soil testing as a way of improving both the fertility of your soil, but also as a way of increasing yield and reducing plant stress. Some places like King County here in Washington State offer three free soil tests to every homeowner, and while these tests are basic in information they give you, it is a good starting point and your local extension service may have something available too. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget that there's more information and articles available on our website and blog at www.kisorganics.com, as well as links to the data and information we discussed in this episode on the podcast page. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please take a moment to leave me a review on iTunes or send me your feedback and suggestions through our website contact page or tad at kissorganics.com. Thanks for listening.